Please welcome Nick Tilson of NDN Collective and Alicia Garza of Black Futures Lab and the co-founder of Black Lives Matter. Thanks for having us on. How madakiapi, Nick Tilson, Amachiapi, Shantea Washtena Petu Zapolo. Uh get to greet you in my uh Lakota language, warm heartfelt handshake, uh language my people have uh, fought, fought, died, and sacrificed for um that we carry on today. Um it's an honor to be here. I want to thank Netroots for having us uh, for, ha- for having us on here um to talk about some important issues. You know, in in this in the current historical moment that we are in in this nation, as we fight for social justice and racial equity in this nation, we cannot forget uh, Indigenous people, and it, and and, we, and Indigenous people have to be a part of helping create this future. And we are locked and ready to be contributing to to, to for this actual future that we're fighting for. You know, if you if you look at look back at the history of indigenous resistance, the American Indian movement was started on the streets of Minneapolis. It was started on Franklin Avenue, and it was started policing the police for uh, you know un, unjust, uh, over excessive force of abuse of uh, of the police force against indigenous people, just blocks and blocks away from where the from where the murder of George Floyd happened. And and if you look throughout the history of our people, uh, there is a direct correlation between the oppression of black and indigenous people in this country. And therefore so much of our collective liberation is actually bound up with one another. And, and I think that's the thing that, that, that excites me about this actual moment in history that we're in. You know, I've been a, li- a lifelong activist um, fighting, you know, in my home community on Pine Ridge to improve the quality of life. You know, you look at the, you look at where Indian country is at, and where indigenous communities are at today, you know, you look at the lowest, uh, you look at the the social de- social determinants of health, and you look at the lowest p- most uh, places of in, uh, poverty in the nation. And if you look at the places where a- economic mobility for children is the lowest, you will always find black and indigenous folks. And 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 I think that there has been sort of like this history for a race to the bottom when we actually should be leaning in with each other around collective liberation for a race to the top. But the top needs to be something that looks just and equitable for all people. And so I think that, you know, in this historic moment, there's a lot of power that we can call upon our ancestors that have come before us. Um, you know, there's a history of, of the American Indian movement and the Black, uh, Black Panther Party working together. And I think that, I think that we're in a moment where we can build on some of that history. And I, I agree with the things that were said here today. We actually have to be talking about power, not just representation, power. And that's what we built the Indian Collective for. Our work here at the Indian Collective is about building the collective power of Indigenous peoples to exercise our inherent right to self-determination while fostering a world built on a foundation of justice and equity for all people and the planet. And that means we have to see a fundamental shift in power in, in, the, in the way that our, even, even the way that our movements are resourced. You know, right now here today, philanthropy spends, spends less than a half of percent of all their resources uh, on indigenous people in, into, indigenous, in, into, into indigenous communities. And that has been the statistic that is true all throughout my whole organizing career, like which is my entire adult life. And, and so we created the Indian Collective to make sure that our movements and to change the conditions of the way in which our movements are actually resourced. And so we're building one of the biggest um, philanthropic funds in the history of philanthropy led 100% by indigenous people for indigenous people because, because, because white supremacy and racial injustice is alive and well in the field of philanthropy. And it's also the part of philanthropy that's actually trying to move our causes forward, but armchair philanthropy so far away from the problems that exist in this country only perpetuates the problem. It doesn't actually solve it. And so, you know, we all know this saying that, you know, we got to get resources closer to the pain and closer to the problem so, so that they're connected to the people who have lived experience in doing this work. And that's what, that's what the NA Collective is all about. You know, we have a foundation that we're building um, so that we can move those resources and actually liberate dollars from these institutions and not only dollars, but liberate decision-making power. 
back into the hands of our communities and our people. And we're doing that both in philanthropy, we're doing that in organizing, we're doing that in narrative building. And so it's not just that we have access, it's about who has decision-making power over that access. And, and so when, you know, when, when, when we think about those things, those are the things that are really important to us. And right now, you know, we are in the process of building this land back movement. And, uh, and, and to us, land, uh, this land back movement and this land back campaign that we are building, it's a framework, right? It's a framework for us as Indigenous people, what we think reparations look like. It's a framework to not just get our, the stolen land of Indigenous people back, uh, back to Indigenous people, but to tear down the systems of white supremacy and oppression that have been created for the stealing of our land because you can connect all of the social determinants of health, the economic problems that we're faced with, all of the, those challenges directly to the stealing of our lands and the oppression of our communities and our people. And I think that there's a moment right now in history to onboard around collective liberation as we dismantle white supremacy in this nation. That was amazing, Nick. And I can't wait to get into conversation with you. I want to offer a couple of words that I think are certainly in line with what you're offering here in terms of having us think about not only what time it is now, but what is it, what are the vehicles that we are building to ultimately get to where it is that we need to be? And so I want to just start this conversation off by saying that um, you know, in a recent meeting, I asked my team, what does it look like in this moment to leave it all on the field? If we are going to uh, not just challenge power, but also transform it, what does the work look like right now where we can say, you know, we gave it absolutely everything we had? And here we are. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you anything you all don't know. We're in the midst of a global pandemic where black communities are under attack from a lack of response. And of course, there's no recovery in sight. We're at the beginning of a deepening economic recession and a sharpening climate emergency. And then of course, to top it all off, we're in the midst of what I think is the most important election cycle in a generation. And democracy is being dismantled before our eyes. In this context, what does it mean to leave it all in the field? Well, first, I think it means keeping our eyes on the prize. So, you know, next week uh, at, the, at the Democratic National Committee convention, um, there's going to be a nomination made for who will challenge this president. There's a platform that is going to be announced that is outlining the issues and the values that supposedly organize this party for the next four years. And for, some, for so many of us who work in politics, these processes are important in certain contexts and for certain reasons. But I can't help but hold with me that there are millions of people who don't work in politics every day, who don't attend conferences like these and don't even know that they exist, millions of people who are trying to figure out how to make a way out of what increasingly becomes no way. And for millions, right, the stimulus check is long gone. For millions, politics has failed to deliver on its promises. And for millions, this is not the kind of change that they believe in. So it makes me realize that what it means to leave it all on the field in this moment, in this context, is our movements. Movements that have developed and have arisen from a desire to see and experience justice and fairness and wellness in our lifetime. And our movements are needed now more than ever because when this president loses and refuses to cede power, we're gonna depend on these movements to get us to the other side. And it is only these movements that can provide that compass for us. I think our primary work right now is twofold. The first is to deliver the kind of mandate unlike any that we have seen in at least a decade, that we will no longer capitulate to white nationalism as an organizing principle for how we be together in this country. It's white nationalism that is shaping this political moment and it's shaping our responses to deep seated wedges in this nation. I think this mandate that we express will initially be expressed through voting but ultimately it has to be expressed by reshaping the structures that keep millions of people out 
who actually need to be at the center of the governing process. And so that's our other key task. It's to continue to push to change and to reshape and reimagine the structures that have kept so many of us left out and left behind. I think we can no longer afford to pay lip service to racial justice, especially in the era of white nationalism, if we hope to reach any semblance of a terrain that we can actually fight on. In an era of white nationalism, we have to understand it's no longer enough to symbolically build movements that ensure representation, but don't actually do the work to weave our lives together in such a way that makes power have new meaning. I think elections are a way for us to test how we've been doing with our organizing. And they're an opportunity for us to choose the terrain that we wanna fight on. Our opponents have made themselves less nebulous and their agenda is more clearly in focus. They are moving power in ways that kick people out of their homes in the midst of a pandemic. They're moving power in ways that deny people access to the healthcare that we need in the midst of a pandemic. They're shrinking the role of government so that democracy can't survive because in their view, it's been too tainted with the movement that we're building to ensure the rights and dignity of those that they don't consider to even be human. So I think we've gotta be clear that this moment, it's about voting, but it's more about showing the power of our movements. It's about picking a clear target and shifting how power operates. And fundamentally, it's about driving white nationalism back underground and putting it in the history books and in museums where it belongs. So let's chat, Nick. We got things to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think one of the I think one of the most exciting things, and this is something I'd like to hear, hear hear your opinion on too, is you know white supremacy and systematic racism is designed to actually divide movements of people of color, black, indigenous, and people of color. And sometimes because we are so struggling for survival that we end up being like on these different tracks and different trajectories of what we think power should look like. And sometimes we fall into that. We fall into um, those structures, maybe not because we're intentionally trying to do that, but because, uh, because actually the system that we are fighting is drawing us further apart than bringing us closer together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've been really thinking about this balance of like, what is it, what is black reparations and indigenous land back look like? And how how can we actually build a world that includes both of those things? Because that's definitely a world I want to raise raise my family up in and, and my grandkids up in one day when I have them. So I was going to see what your, you know, kind of your thoughts were on, on that a little bit and how we lean into that to make these actual structural shifts. Absolutely. Well, you know, what's funny, Nick, is I was going to ask you the same question. So we're going to have to go back and forth here. But fundamentally, I think that this is a question of how it is that we um, not only reclaim and reshape power, but it's also a question of how it is that we tell each other different stories about each other. I think that at the core of reparations, right, there is, you're absolutely right. Earlier you said, you know, it's not just about right um, land back. It's also about restructuring how it is that we be together. And I think the, the first part of kind of bringing these reparations frameworks together is fundamentally about changing the stories that we tell each other about each other that actually are not our stories, right? So <laughs> there is something in here for me about, um, you know, what it looks like to uh, uh, have deeper discussions, right? About the legacy of slavery as a um, as a vehicle to consolidate and direct power in a particular direction. I think it makes sense for us to be talking about the unique roles that each of our communities have played um, and the ways in which we've been played <laughs> in the project, right? To build this country as a foundation for us to start to think about, well, in a different, set up, right? Um, what would be the fundamental principles that would undergird our unity, right? And where are the sticky points to? Um, so just to be super clear in there, I think um, in, a, in a capitalist country, 
right? Where everything can be bought or sold. Um, and everything is, is for profit, right? And not for people. There's a worldview, <laughs> right? That also has to be shifted as a part of shifting our relationships. And so many of us, right, are used to um, a framework, right, where we understand um, uh, land, right, as a thing that you own, that you can buy and you can sell, as opposed to a thing that is your birthright or a thing that needs to be cared for or a thing that cares for us, right? And so I just wonder if um, part of the, the undergirding to a project like that is really about um, unseating, right, how it is that we understand um, uh, the value, right, of building these kinds of new structures and new um, ways of being organized together. How yeah. about you, Nick? What do you think? I mean, I, I, yeah, I think it's about shifting power, you know. I mean, oh, excuse me. I think it's about shifting power. <laughs> I mean, the, uh, Rashad said something, <coughs> well, excuse me. <coughs> this happens to me all the time. Take your time. <laughs> so it's definitely about power. And you're going to take a, a sip of water? <laughs> Sorry about that. You got this. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, it's it, to me it's like we have to do the work that our ancestors want us to do our ancestors want liberation for our people that's right our ancestors want our connection to our land and to nature and to each other to be restored this is spiritual work this is powerful work and i think that our movements play a fundamental role i mean elections are elections but just like movements, our organizations are tools for change, but movements are made up of people. That's right. We all have these handles, right? NDN Collective, Black Futures Lab, all these different organizations. But at the end of the day, they're merely tools for liberation. That's and I think that what we say when, when our brothers and sisters aren't in the room is so important. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what we say about the leadership as, as indigenous people, of, of the movement for black lives and black liberation when 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 those leaders aren't in the room to our own communities is important vice versa so that's like a fundamental way that we can shift culture and real unity because then you create intention truly with one another yeah. um i think that when you think about the decision making structures that's why to us you know you look at you look at what what it would mean to have land back back to indigenous people that all of a sudden the conversation about corporate pipelines that are coming through our territory or, you know, nuclear waste storage on our lands or the, you know, some corporate farm coming up to exploit our communities and our people um, or what they're doing with the KXL pipeline or the Dakota Access pipeline or Line 3 or any of these pipelines, that, that conversation fundamentally changes because we have gotten our land back and we're in the decision-making seat of our own of our own communities and of our own future. That's right. And I think that is the shift that we need to really begin to see. I agree with you. And I'm wondering, Nick, too, how you, if you deal with this as well, which is, um, or let me phrase this differently. Do you think that our movements, I mean, we talk a lot about power, the need to build it, the need to wield it. Do you think that we're afraid of power? And if so, why? And if not, what do you think gets in our way to building the kind of power that we need in order to change our conditions? I mean, I think, uh, I think, wow, that's a deep one there. I'm thinking about that one. I do think that we are afraid of power. I think that we're not afraid of power or afraid of change. Mm. Um, and I think that in the process um, of, of, of oppression and colonization, they have beaten us down in our minds and our spirit. And that's why our social, uh, why our movements aren't just about achieving victory, right? We're all like, especially those of us who are like seasoned organizers, right? You got to win. What's the win look like? Checkbox. Win, 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 you know? And, but reality is our movements are part of that healing journey. 
are part of the radical transformation for our future. Mm -hmm. And the, the movements that we're building, they're part of the, you know, they're part of the, the energy and the spiritual en energy that will actually shift from this, I, this place of burn it down to build it back up. Mm -hmm. With being it clear that burning it down is a fundamental part of us being able to even get there. And that in the same breath that we have to be building it back up. Um, but it's in, it's not just that we do it, it's how we do it. And I think that's why the movements are part of that is about this growth. And, you know, the, the land back action that I had the opportunity to be a part of on my own lands in the sacred, um, Hesapa, mm -hmm. when we protested 45 rolling into the, 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 the lands of the Osheti Shakoi, okay. you know, we were like, you know, our political analysis of that particular situation was this president just went to Tulsa around Juneteenth. And now he's going to come into the heart of the Osheti Shakoi of our lands mm -hmm. around the time of Independence Day one, in, in, in a, in a, to, to a mountain that was carved by a, a member of the Ku Klux Klan on land that was stolen. Mm -hmm. Even land that the U.S. Constitution, uh, the, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, in 1980 said that was so stolen and, uh, and and we had to do something and the fact that we were standing there on our own lands and experienced you know the the, the wrath of the military force of this country of having a you know a couple hundred indigenous people standing on their own lands that the constitution or that the supreme court even said was our own lands and the fact that now in this moment you know we are facing huge amounts of charges. I mean, right now, myself, I'm facing up to 15 years in prison for the activism that I took there. And along with my 20, 20 other land defenders are also facing charges. Yet the people on that mountain were slave owners. They, 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 they they're, they're mass murderers. They did the largest execution of indigenous people, or, uh, uh, the largest mass hanging in the history of the country when, they, when, when Abraham Lincoln you know, uh, hung, uh, ordered, ordered the hang of 38 Dakotas after the Dakota uprising. And these are the ironies. And that's not unique. You look all across the whole country. You think about how many people yeah. that are both leaders and not leaders of all of these movements that are facing time right now for the, for, for the rebellion that is now taking place. That, that cannot continue because all of us that are in those places are assets to not only the movement that we're building now, we're, we're assets to the future. That's right. I mean, I'll just close by saying that, you know, what is powerful about what you just said, Nick, is that it underscores that our fight right now is not, it's, we're not, it's not Biden versus Trump, it's fascism versus democracy. And frankly, you know, the fact that you could be facing 15 years in federal prison for protecting land is ludicrous and it's asinine. And what is real, right, is that I am not being facetious when I say this president doesn't plan to go nowhere, we gonna have to push him out. And the reason why, right, is because what you are facing and what so many other activists here are facing as well in terms of, excuse my pun, trumped up charges um, and really being targeted for trying to make change. What we're facing is that if we do not deliver this mandate in November, those conditions will get sharper. So we've got to be very, very clear what we're up against so that you and I and so many others get to actually do the work of building the new society and the new democracy that we so desperately deserve. I really appreciate you, Nick. Thank you for spending time with me today. Absolutely. It's an honor to be on here. And just, you know, just a quick plug. We are launching a national campaign. Um, you can find out more about the campaign at landback.org. Indigenous, uh, you know, this movement that we're building will, uh, the Landback campaign will be a mechanism to tear, tear down white supremacy and build a, an avenue to create um, collective liberation between black, brown, indigenous folks all throughout this country. So we look forward to doing all that work with each and every one of you out there. So I can't wait to check it out. Thank you, Nick. All and right. thank you to Net Roots. Absolutely. Thanks, Net Roots. Thank you. Wow. Wasn't that spine tingling? Our ancestors do want liberation for all of us working as one. I feel that in my spirit. And let's not be afraid to use our power to create that better world we can see just over the horizon. 
thank you, Alicia and Nick, for those visionary and futuristic remarks.